All right, welcome to the Bowling University studio in the International Bowling Campus here in Arlington, Texas. I'm Bart Berger, and I'll be your host for this edition of the Bowling University Profit Break. Thank you for joining us. Our mission here at the university is to enrich people's lives personally and professionally, and the Profit Break is an opportunity for sharing insights on how to grow revenue, reduce costs, enrich yourself, your team, and your business. If you're joining us for the first time on the Profit Break, welcome. We're glad you're here. Give us 15 minutes and you'll be well on your way to improving your profitability. Now today we have with us a great friend of the bowling industry, Mr. Danny Gruning. Danny is the VP of Marketing for Creative Works, where fun meets passion. Now Danny is a frequent guest lecturer at the Bowling University Management Schools. We're fortunate to have him there. We're fortunate to have him with us today. Before joining the Creative Works team, Danny spent some time with a brand you may have heard of, Disney, where he learned from some of the best customer service training in the world. Now currently he's helping operators all over the country with attractions mix, hiring and training, as well as operating best practices. Uh, Danny, great to see you again, and welcome back. Thank you for having me here, Bart. It's a pleasure to be back. Awesome. Always good when we have you here. So, Danny, let's start off at the top here. Um, a lot of bowling centers have been diversifying their kind of their product mix, their attraction over the last five to ten years. Why is that? And then do you see this uh, trend continuing? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll start off by saying it's been as the industry has evolved, evolved, it's been a very exciting journey for our company to be a small part of, right? You know, we think about the way that entertainment looks today. It's very different from the way it looked 15, 20 or more years ago or even five to 10 years ago, right? One of the things that's happening is that um, – Really, the, the biggest driver behind this evolution is that bowling centers and entertainment centers in general want to stay relevant with their target customer. And in order to stay relevant, it's important to bring in other attractions. Now, bowling is clearly an important attraction to this industry. That's not changing anytime soon. That's going to continue to be the case. But more and more often, we're seeing bowling centers either maybe uh, take out some of their uh, meeting space or maybe adjust some of their bowling lanes to add other attractions or expand their buildings to bring in other attractions. And really, they want to stay relevant with their customers, uh, the changing needs and uh, wants of those customers and be able to bring them back into the door again and again. So and one of the other big things that's happening is that a lot of times consumers today don't want to run errands for their entertainment, right? They want to be able to go to a single place that has an option for multiple people in the family or it allows them to do multiple things. And what's great about that is that the more you can offer typically the longer you can keep people in the door and the longer you keep them in the door the more money they spend and it makes it easier to bring them back again in the future so it's one of those things where it's been very exciting to see it evolve and i see that continuing into the future with additional attractions and being able to offer more than just a typical bowling center would yeah, great stuff there. I, I love the fact you talked about the dwell time, the amount of time that people spend in your facility, and the fact that as, as even you and I as consumers, right, we look for that kind of one-stop shopping. We don't want to go to multiple places, want to take care of it in, in one sitting and do so many different offerings. So good stuff there. So, uh, Danny, let's say that maybe I'm thinking about uh, reallocating some of my physical space, and I've been more traditional bowling for uh, a, a lot of years. What are some of the considerations that operators give when they're thinking about new attractions? There's, there's a lot to choose from. How, how do I know even where to start? So I think one of the important things, there's, there's a couple factors to consider. One is whatever attraction or attractions you're going to add, is this going to be a primary anchor attraction or is this going to be more of a secondary complementary attraction? And what I mean by that is typically an anchor attraction or primary, if you want to call it that, um, is going to be one of the things that drives traffic through your door. For bowling centers, bowling is one of those anchor attractions, and it always will be because it's been around for so long and it's so relevant for a lot of different age groups, right? But a lot of times, for example, one of the very common attractions that bowling centers will add when they want to diversify would be something like a laser tag arena. A lot of times, a laser tag is a really good anchor attraction to get more people through the door and draw them in. Versus you might have things that are complementary attractions, where a great example of this is something like an 
arcade, right? And arcades have been around at bowling centers for a long time. Very few people are going to go to an entertainment facility specifically for the arcade. But once they're there, they end up spending their time and their money on that attraction. Or maybe it's something that they're doing while they're waiting for their, their lane to open up or while they're waiting for one of the other primary attractions that they do want to play. So there's that difference between the primary and the secondary. And that will then kind of inform the next couple of things that you need to think about. One is the capacity of that attraction. How many people in an hour are you going to be able to get through that space? Something like an arcade, you get lots of people through. Something like a laser tag arena, you get a lot of people through. But there are other attractions that may have um, a, a bit of a lower capacity, just depending on what it is. Now, um, with that capacity is also the throughput of how many people can fit in a game, how many people can get through in an hour. But that goes goes hand in hand as well with how much space is that going to take up, right? You don't necessarily want to dedicate a, a huge amount of space to something that is a lower capacity and lower throughput attraction because it's hard to uh, justify that square footage going there. So it's kind of that little balancing act. And those types of things, the, the, the throughput, the attraction experience, the size of it, primary versus secondary, also allows you to determine what should the price point be for that particular attraction. All, all great points. I know you're going to take a much deeper dive in all that when you join us in a few months at, at Bull Expo there in, in Vegas, and we're looking forward to having you. But how about, uh, bef before we dig to the next topic there, we're thinking about these various attractions. You've given us all these things to consider about. What role do the demographics in your market play? I mean, I know a lot of people talk about the popularity of laser tag and the game room and some of the escape room and things you mentioned. But what role does the market play with understanding which is best for my facility? That's a great question. And I think it, it all comes down to being able to identify who is your target market? Who is your target customer? Sometimes it can be easy for a bowling center because bowling is uh, relevant for so many different age groups from someone who's five years old to someone who's 95. Everyone can play bowling, right? It can be easy to say, well, my target market is everybody. But if you try to be all things to all people, you'll be special to no one. And so the way that I like to think about it is who's your primary target market and then who's your secondary target market? And and really, it, it breaks down to, into the multiple generations from youngest to oldest. You've got your Gen Z, which are those middle school, high school, and college kids. You've got your millennials, which are like mid-20s to mid-30s. You've got your Gen Xers, which are going to be mid to late 30s to uh, mid to late 40s. Um, and then you've got your boomers are typically going to be 55 and older. And it's interesting because even though each generation has their own interests. They all behave in certain ways. They all make buying decisions in different ways. A lot of different attractions can be geared toward those different demographics just by making adjustments. So as an example, I'll use laser tag again because it happens to be a very common attraction that's in the uh, bowling entertainment industry. You can t uh, create an attraction that's really geared toward your birthday party crowd, really geared to those um, you know, younger kids and middle schoolers, more that Gen Z generation, by having a theme maybe that's um, a little bit more um, brightly colored and a little bit more family friendly and a little bit more maybe cartoony, if you want to call it that. Um, or at the same time, you can take a laser tag attraction and you can turn it into something that's really geared toward more of an uh, adult crowd. Maybe you want to make it something that's more of a, a war-torn um, city, kind of feeling like Call of Duty or some of those very popular first-person shooter video games, even in individual attractions, you can adjust them in order to accommodate different types of demographics and generations. No, Dan, that's some great insights, and I hope that our viewers were all taking that in because it's very powerful. You know, one of I often say that one sometimes your greatest strength can become your greatest weakness, and that is that our primary product, bowling, appeals from three to 103, but we can't appeal to everyone three to 103, so we have to define that market. So good, good, good stuff there. So let's. We made our decision. We've defined the market. We went through all your steps. Um, so I've made a decision on X. X is my product that I'm going to put in there. Uh, how can I market these new attractions to, to my audience there and let folks know that I have that? I know that's going to be some things that you, you share with us when we gather. 
Yeah, so there's a couple of different things, and we'll hit on these briefly because you could make presentations on each one of these individual topics, but a couple of things are the value of a soft opening, right? You want to be able to first make sure your staff knows how to operate that attraction, they can handle customers, understand the flow, how to be able to move people through and still provide an, a great experience. But as part of that soft opening, you can do a specific soft opening event where you invite the press and all the local media to allow them to play and experience it, and there's a really good chance that they may do a story about your new attraction in your business because it's something that's very visual, it's very family friendly, it's fun, it's the kind of story that local news really wants to tell. You also have the opportunity to do, let's say you want to have a uh, soft opening evening where you invite a, a whole bunch of school administrators, school teachers, and youth group leaders, right? Bring all them in, people who um, will be able to potentially bring their, their youth groups into your, into your center in the future, or if they want to have field trips because you can make an educational opponent, maybe component about it. Maybe it's related to the physics of bowling or anything else, right? Being able to bring in some of these audiences to let them know, hey, here's what we have. Come and play for free. It'll be a great time. And you're able to showcase some of the things that you can do. As part of, of the, the media side of things that I had mentioned, you can also pitch local media. Reach out and say, hey, listen, we have this really cool story because we just added X, Y, and Z attractions, and we're really going to be able to, to bring in new age groups and going to be this really exciting environment. We'd love to have you come out and do a story. They won't always say yes, but it doesn't hurt to ask to be able to try to pitch that story to them. And another really important thing is going to be focusing on bundling and packages, right? If you've got a, a new attraction that you really want to be able to drive traffic to, make sure that you're building in uh, bundles at the front counter or different birthday party packages that specifically include that attraction. And that will allow you to get a lot more revenue generated for that because you're kind of marketing it to your most important audience. Danny, some great takeaways. Uh, there's enough there that makes me want to have another grand opening and just have the excuse to put some of those into practice there. Some good stuff. So uh, we got time for one more before we have to wrap up uh, this episode. And I, I think you mentioned that uh, this could be its own episode, but let's just highlight a little bit about virtual reality. VR uh, seems to be the new it thing that everybody's talking about. It, it's a little overwhelming for those of us that may not follow as close as you do. Not to mention it seems to be very expensive. Um, where and how does this possibly fit into the model? I mean, is it really VR's time? Yeah, so, you know, uh, some people have a little bit of whiplash from uh, VR back in the 80s and, and what happened, it, it exploded and it completely collapsed, right? There's a lot of things that are different about VR now with the, the level of immersion, the throughput and capacity, the quality of the gaming, the price points being much lower uh, than they used to be. All those things make this VR renaissance, I think, something that's going to stick around for a long time. Um, and it can be overwhelming. There are so many different attractions that are VR-focused or have a VR component to it that it can make operators head spin because they're not really sure where to start. And so I think there's a really good way to kind of approach this um, and kind of categorize it to make it a little bit easier to digest. You're right. This could be something where we could spend an hour talking about just VR and nothing else. But as a high-level overview, typically VR is going to come in one of three categories. The first is going to be arcade, and then you've got hybrid, and then you've got free roam. And some of the characteristics of each of those. First off, uh, arcade, uh, they're going to be much smaller footprint, uh, lower capacity. One to two players will be able to play them at a time. The game length will be much shorter than others. It's like one to three minutes. Uh, how much you can charge per play is going to be a little bit lower than others in that kind of maybe the two or three all the way up to five or six dollar range, just depending on what it is in your market. Um, you don't need staff requirement for them. They can take swipe cards or any other payment that you have in the rest of your arcade, um, and they're a really small footprint. Then the next up, you've got hybrid attractions, and these are called hybrid because they're uh, smaller than a full-blown really big attraction, um, but they're more involved uh, than something like an arcade piece. So hybrid attraction, uh, your quantity of players and your throughput, you're going to be at two to six players at a time. Game length is going to be somewhere between, uh, you know, three to seven or eight minutes. 
Price point, you're looking at anywhere from five to 12 bucks. Um, your square footage is probably gonna be somewhere between 150 and 400 square feet, somewhere in that range. Um, and then some of the differences that start happening here is that you would have a staff member that would be required in order to operate this attraction. Then on the largest scale, you've got free roam. Now, free roam is going to be much longer games. These can be anywhere from 10 to 30 or more minutes. Uh, your player count is going to be anywhere from 6 to 12 or more at a time. Uh, your square footage is going to be, you know, minimum starting that four to 500 square foot range and going up from there, depending on the attraction and how much square footage that you want to allocate for it. Uh, and you're able to charge a lot more for that experience, anywhere from 10 to maybe even upwards of 40 or $50, again, depending on how long the experience is and what you're offering. Uh, there's a lot more that we can get into, but that's sort of a basic helpful categorization between arcade, a little bit bigger as hybrid, and then a little bit bigger as the free roam. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Some great, great insights there. And it sounds like in the space of VR, there really is this time around a little something for everyone there. So as always, uh, great insights to, to share with us there. Looking forward to seeing you in, in Vegas there. Thank you so much for spending a few moments with us. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. Hey, everybody. And remember, if you'd like to learn even more about what attractions are right for your location, Danny B will be one of our featured speakers at Bowl Expo in Las Vegas this June. Dan Danny's 90-minute learning lab, choosing the right attraction attractions for your market, will be taking place on Tuesday, June 28th, 4.15 p.m., and you are not going to want to miss it. So as we wrap up another edition of the Bowl University Profit Break, remember that when your focus is on growing people, people will grow your business. We look forward to seeing you next week for another great episode. If you have any questions about today's show or would like additional information, you can reach us anytime at education at bpaa.com. Also, you and your team can watch any of our episodes 24-7 by visiting bowlinguniversity.net. The Profit Break is now available when you want it, and we have episodes premiering every month. Until then, I'm Bart Berger, and remember, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. We'll see you next time.